a little talk called Signals in the Noise. It's not your typical Agile meetup, as you'll soon find out. Uh, first off, I'd like to do a bit of housekeeping. Uh, thanks to Simon, Mika, and Charlie for arranging this. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about meningitis in the first five minutes. Has anybody here had it before or is affected by friends and family that have had it? No? Good. Okay. With that, um, I have a several uh, things that the curious amongst you might have started symptom spotting. So when my brain expanded, it crushed my left audio nerve, uh, so my left ear doesn't work whatsoever. My left eye has a little disc in the back of it because the optic nerve got a squeeze as well. And uh, my balance is sometimes a bit suspect. Uh, because I've got no hearing here, then when I look at people and try to communicate with you, I sometimes turn my head away and raise an eyebrow. Uh, that's not me being disrespectful or disdainful, it's just the way things are. Sometimes that's called my Jira face. <laughs> it's the one that you make when you meet people who go, we're agile, yeah, we're using Jira. <laughs> so, um, because I'm a bit blind as well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some glow sticks, and uh, you just break these and wave them around. So here's a bit of music to... And that's it. So thank you. Well done. We can use the we can use the glow sticks at various points throughout the evening for bits and pieces. You can have a, an idea of what you might want to do with them. Uh, and at the end, we're going to get pizza from Voodoo Ray. So for those of you that know your guy called Gerald, you can rave again. And what we're going to do is we're going to morph uh, some metaphors from pizza to business by way of music. So we're going to start with a four slice pizza. We're going to morph it to a 12 slice pizza and a slightly bigger color wheel. And now we're going to look at a stack of pizzas and some stuff called pitch class. And along the way, we're going to use a lot of business models as well. The company that I've set up is called Time and Emotion. It's a play on time and motion as set up by Ford and F.W. Taylor a long time ago. The things we do are research. I was working on some research um, before I got the meningitis in 2015. Uh, I've gone back to it now. We offer also consultancy and we do Suzuki style lean training for various things agile and beyond. So the structure of tonight's talk is going to take about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. If we've got time at the end, I'll do an encore, <laughs> which shows you why your requirements continuously change. Uh, on a more serious note, uh, product roadmaps are to be binned. What I'm going to show you is product set nav, if we have time. So the stuff that I've been researching over the last five years is climate. Uh, climate is team level culture, uh, which we'll come to shortly. And what we found is that there's things that people continuously report are lacking in their work, which is idea time, idea support. So I'm going to show you how we can get hold of those very quickly. And then we're going to look at signals in the noise, the music of business. So about me, I'm Scottish, as you can probably tell. Uh, at school, I was very average. I've done university twice. First time round, I did engineering. Second time round, I did an MBA. You can see that I was a coder for 25 years. As my chops grew slow, I went and did the MBA and became a manager. Uh, MBA is just a way of having a lobotomy, if you know. Uh, so I've been a manager for five years. I've written two books. The places I've worked, I started on the oil rigs. I've worked as the Parliament, Scott, Dev, uh, City, and laterally at Harrods. In um, the summer of 2015, I had an ear infection which I scooshed with some spray. I went to yoga 
And halfway through the yoga class, I got a little pain across the sacrum. I thought, oh, I've discovered Kundalini, the sacred goddess of yoga. But no, it was meningitis, death by downward dog, if you will. So I got home um, that evening, and the pain had come up from the head, the body to the head. So it was like getting the flu in reverse, but it came very quickly. I went to bed, uh, and that was it. Um, the next day, the phone rang about 11 o'clock, just as my daughter was leaving the house. So she came to get me for the phone call uh, and found me comatose in bed. So she got 999. It must have been a bit of a quiet day because eight paramedics turned up, three cars and one ambulance. So they jumped on me, uh, got me done, took me in the ambulance, off the hospital. As it was a Friday, the cleaners turned up and my wife had been away. She was in Iceland doing a, a walk for breast cancer. So they come into this bedroom where the bread is like Tracy Emmons. <laughs> Across the floor, there's all these silver wrappers and bandages. <laughs> that guy, what's he been up to, you know? <laughs> Not realizing what was done, but they did the cleaning for free for the next month, so that was good. Um, so I had small bleeds here. My head expanded out that way, as I told you, and it was up and down. So uh, when I recovered, um, I had to learn to walk because the two big toes on my left foot went numb. So when I was in, after getting out of two weeks in a coma in King's College Hospital, they put me back to the normal hospital for five weeks. And after they put me on solids, about four in the morning, I kind of wake up and think, hmm, I need to go someplace. So you kind of swivel around, get out of bed, bang. <laughs> Legs not working. <laughs> so off you go to the toilet and do what you have to do and get back. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've had a head injury, but medics, they always want to know what day of the week is it? What day of the week? So they came in that morning and said, what day of the week do you think it is? I went, oh, I think it's Sunday. Yeah. Well, why do you know that? I said, well, I'm using the furniture to get around. <laughs> After a good Saturday night, if you know what I mean. So um, when I was going through the recovery, um, I had various things. Ten days after I came out of the coma, they asked me to draw a clock. It looked like this. Yeah. Uh, now, this has some benefits later on in life. They asked me to do this some. Um, yeah, we all know it. it. Took me five minutes. I'm getting better. I've got it down to about two and a half now with lots of practice. Um, my brain felt like this. You know, if I'd taken my brain and spatchcocked it and put the Moscow underground on it, it was like that for stuff coming in. So. The kind of things that were going on with that were um, here. So if, if in the um, summer you'd asked me a question, we were sitting together, and if you could look into the back of my head, it would have looked like this. So there's a kind of tree growing where I go out to try and get the information. It then finds the information and starts to knit it together and then it puts the emotion on and sends it back out. And that whole process would take about 30 seconds. So I'd have to disconnect from the conversation process and then speak again. The letters that you see underneath is a Lyndon Meyer fractal. So that's actually the stuff that's drawing the tree above there. That's uh, pretty good. Another thing that happened um, on the beginning of September, I was watching the proms, and Andreas Schiff was playing a bit of Bach, uh, the Goldberg Variations, and this happened. So there was a kind of Buddha appeared in front of me, and all these little green and red dots started shifting around quite easily. So I opened my eyes, <laughs> back in the room, oh, fantastic. If I could take that, bottle it and sell it, you know, people wouldn't do Agile anymore. <laughs> So, anyway, in the stages of recovery, you know, I went from being as helpless as a baby. I didn't realize I was wearing a nappy when I was in the coma until the nurses came along one day, just before a guest arrived, and said, let's tidy you up. <laughs> oh, a shave, maybe? <laughs> no, <laughs> hoist up, the sound of ripping diapers. <laughs> a bit of a wet wipe. <laughs> there we go. As I went through the next six months, I went back to childhood, because I'd read about Jung. And when his wife died, he went and played with the toys he played with as a kid. So I knew that that was one way to go. And where I went back into 
cartooning. I really enjoyed Disney cartoons when I was a kid. And then I got to re-examining what I wanted to do. Uh, and now what I've decided is that I'm going to turn the hobby into a business. So one year on, I wrote a book called comarathonman.com. Very good, yeah. Coma Marathon. Uh, the reason for that was that I ran the Brighton Marathon as part of my recovery. I didn't mean to, I just got in the wrong place. No. <laughs> um, I'd been uh, going to the gym three times a week, and then on the train up to London, I saw that there was a, um, people looking for runners for the Brighton Marathon for charity, so I looked up meningitis. They were looking for runners. I went into it. So I did that. Uh, I got a really nice letter from a guy in Barcelona uh, about three months after the book went out. He read it, recognised the symptoms that I was describing, gone to the doctor and got a week in the hospital. So I can't say that it saved his life, but it made a difference to him and it gave his kids. So with that kind of thing, it kind of inspires me to move and with that moving, it sounds like this. So that's um, Chariots of Fire. Eric Little went to the same university as me. Uh, he didn't run on a Sunday because of his beliefs. This year I've taken a leaf out of his book and I'm not running on a Sunday because that's the day marathons are. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're away from that. Uh, the other thing about Little was that with his belief, uh, after he, it, the, the story of him was that he went to run the 100 metres but couldn't do the heats because they were on a Sunday, so he went in for the 400 metres at the Olympics and won. And then after he'd finished running, he went and became a missionary in China and died of a brain hemorrhage in a Japanese internment camp in about 1943. But the other thing that's great about that story, from my viewpoint, is that Van Gelis scored it with just one synthesizer rather than having an orchestra. And that's really the base of where my talk's going to go later on. Because I think that IT is a bit like orchestra sometimes, rather than the agile bands we think we are. So, because I can stretch time with that mind-bending clock that I did, I see one hour of music as being equivalent, roughly proportional, to one year at work. And by that, I mean that strategy is a three-year plan. Opera is a three-hour series of three acts over time. Operations, middle managers, they look about a year ahead. So they're looking at symphonies, concertos, or a progressive rock band at what they are. Um, and the strategy, where well, that's opera. I mean, you do know that opera is Italian for work anyway. <laughs> so it's all about work. And the guys who are running the company they kind of, in my view, they see IT as being like the orchestra in the pit, which is just supporting and adding a bit of emotional credence to the storyline, the same way that you get a soundtrack on a film. That's what I see with business. Agile teams are a bit like blues-based pop or whatever, and there's ways that we can get around that later on. Um, that's good. Uh, so it could be more like a musical, more up-to-date. And the other thing that I found quite interesting which I just dropped into conversation one day uh, was the first rule of systems thinking as I saw it, which is don't use the system under consideration as the observing system. So if you're having problems with agile, don't use agile to try and look at it. You won't get anywhere. <coughs> so if we pop on to the research that I've been doing, climate, two-level culture, told you to start in 2012. Uh, the results that come out of this is that there's pain points for people like us who are players in the companies. Idea time and idea support are the things that people want. Uh, I know this because of the research. It's based on Euron Ekval's uh, climate model, which is 50 years old. Um, I asked for Euron Ekval to do a preface for the updated book that my co-author and I are putting out, I uh, found out that he died about three years ago, but the company that carry on his work have been very supportive and uh, are wishing us good luck as we go ahead. So with the climate model, we started doing it, Cray, in about 2010, 2011, that managers started asking for it, and now we're asked in every job that we go if we can do it. The model itself measures 10 dimensions in the business. 
Playfulness, challenge, risk-taking, dynamism, idea time, conflicts, idea support, debates, trust, openness, and freedom. In there, conflicts is the one that you want to keep low. The American version of this model doesn't mention conflicts, but I find it can be useful from time to time. This is taken from an advertising agency that did the survey in August 2016 in a uh, Dutch company. In the UK, we can see some of the samples that we've got here. Uh, the 2012 trading one, we can see that the idea time and idea support are low, but not as low as freedom. That company treated their staff who felt as if they were in a psychic prison. 2013 publishing, again, idea time and idea support are low. Everything else is quite high. Uh, 2014 was a merger and acquisition for two logistics companies. So their dynamism was quite low, as well as idea time and idea support. And 2017, we're back on the case, looking at retail. We can see idea time, idea supports low. Uh, uh, 2014, uh, my colleague Keith Burnett and I wrote a book. And in that month, uh, we got it to number one in the Kindle consulting charts. <laughs> so as you could see, one of the things that we did there when we looked at the climate uh, was to set up an innovation initiative for a publishing company. And this is where the, the four slice model comes in. So this is really a, a training model that we did. We did the exercise with them. We gave them uh, some new metrics to get hold of so as they could measure stuff. And we'll come back to this later on. So this scan, design, deliver, value model is a commercial learning cycle. It's something that you do by yourself in a team or at any level in a business. The types of things that we scan could be the environment. We all do it all the time, subconsciously. Our polyvagal system, the thing that connects our nerves to our organs to our brain, is doing it all the time. Primarily, one of the functions of the brain is camouflage, is how we do it. It gives you your gut feel, your sixth sense. You go that way. In work, usually the environment is set. If you've got to work from home, you might have to have a conversation with your partner to take the small children out so that you can be left alone to watch Jeremy Kyle and raid the fridge and pretend to do some work. Um, the design factor that I find within Agile, there's not enough time to do real design. You know, it's all smash bang, planning's very start of the sprint, you're not doing much design. There's three types of design that we ask people to do, creative, critical, and cognitive. We're going to look at creative in the detail. Critical is really just being satirical. And as Brits, we're brilliant at that. Cognitive, we're very good. Very good at that because of our um, computing abilities. Delivery, we think of at team level as build and release. But there's a level above that, a more personal level, where we can get stuff from it. And value is really the absorption by other people and the impact of what we do. So the learning cycle that we're looking at wasn't plucked out of thin air. It's based on two standard models, plan, do, check, act, which comes out of the Kanban system from Japan in the 50s, and Kolb, which is a standard reflective practice learning cycle that you will get taught in any business school that you go to. So in summary of the research, we've got five years research. We're working with Scott Isaacson, who's Ekval's successor, he and his company have 50 years research that we're looking at. We're specializing in the UK. And because it's consistent, those goals for idea time and idea support, the time and emotion offer is, we will come to your office, measure your climate. We'll get, do it, we do it quickly and we do it anonymously. Uh, people just stick dots on a bit of paper. They're not seen by their bosses. It makes the act, results more accurate. So we can give you a benchmark comparison and a report with recommendations. So to fix idea time, really it's a case of being able to generate ideas quickly. Now there's three keys that we're going to look at, modes and moods. Um, are there any instrument players or musicians in tonight? Cool. Are you familiar with modes? Okay. Bit. So just think of modes as moods. Uh, if you've got your phone, please jump on it and go to this web address, uh, timeandemotion.com. Uh, 
and what we're going to do is use the splash screen on it, which is an example of how I think the user journey is going to change. So if you remember a few years back, Microsoft ran an advert, where do you want to go today? Right? As I said, we Brits are very satirical, and this is my attempt at it. So it's, how do you want to work today? And from that, you can click the drop down, and you can be bright, stable, major, beautiful, cool, minor, funky, open, floating. Exotic, brooding, minor, heartbreaking, dark, but James Bond. Uh, bright, hip, major, comical, clever, moving, transient, funky, open, floating, and so on. Uh, down at the bottom is uh, avoidance, disconnect, so so. So if you choose one of those, which does it, most people either go for uh, the first one or the fourth one, but we'll go for the third one. Uh, and that shows some fancy colors, and what you do is you get a little Spotify symbol, and you click through onto Spotify. Uh, so the words that describe the feelings are describing musical modes, and you know in music, if you don't play, that you've got major scales and minor scales, and there's another five in there, which uh, can be seen. Here, so you, they're named after the Greek islands for some Greek reason. But what it is, it's a way of starting to get yourself lined up for the day without having to think about something. You can put your mood on the day by choice rather than having other people put theirs on you. The second thing that we do is uh, we do left and right brains, and this is going to come out like a kind of mixing desk for your brain. So. This is the way we are taught at school, Bloom's Taxonomy. Years one and two, you get the experience and knowledge. Years three and four, GCSEs, you get analysis and application. Then you go on and you do synthesis and evaluation. NASA commissioned research which started in 1968, which shows that creativity deteriorates over our lifetime. This was carried out by George Land and Teresa Amabili, who is a paragon of creativity at business. Uh, I would come back and challenge this. What I think he's measuring is the slowness of the way that the prefrontal cortex evolves. In between the two, we have the connectome. That is a map of the white matter in your head. The gray matter is around the outside. The white matter is the bit that connects it. And you can do stuff with that, as I have found, as my brain healed that allows you to escape other things that you might have. For instance, uh, we'll show you later. And there's a couple of hierarchies. So in the brain hierarchy, for me, when I think of computing, I think of architecture, environment, design, tests, and code. Very left side, logical. Uh, and on the right, I use Schopenhauer's hierarchy of aesthetics. Architecture, landscape architecture, could be environment poetry and prose, sculpture and art and music. And when you think about the similarity between music and work, it's just really events scheduled over time. You look at a musical score, it's events for different people to do and it's orchestrated together. In Agile, it's a bit more free jazz sometimes. So, uh, with the Brain app, Does anybody not know the Belbin scale? Okay, uh, Belbin was a lecturer at Henley Management College, uh, and when he was teaching managers things, he found that they split, fell into nine different roles, which were complete a finisher, the person who gets things done, the shaper who provides the way of getting stuff moving in teams, maybe a scrum master, an implementer who got things moving at a higher level, monitor evaluator, plant who tried to be creative and good at solving problems in unconventional ways, uh, specialist, resource investigator, teamwork and a coordinator. And basically they fall into three categories, thinking, doing and people. 
So that gives us the, the left brain from the psychometric thing. And I don't agree with all psychometric tests because I've done Belbin four times and got four different results just because I think differently when I do it are all completely inconsistent. Um, on the right side, we use De Bono's thinking hats. Are people familiar with De Bono? Yeah. So De Bono has six hats, and you put on a different hat when you want to think in a different way. So if you put on the black hat, it's to deal with problems. Red is, you, you go intuitive, gut feel. Blue is metacognition, thinking about thinking. Uh, green is ideas and alternatives. And yellow is positives, plus points, and the white's data. And again, this all comes in through the connectome. So with this, you can select a preset. So if we said, let's look at people, and it'll move the banks of the controls around, as if it was a mixing desk in a recording studio, but instead of having speakers, you've got a left brain and a right brain. So if you wanted to do something on the right side, say you wanted to go intuitive, you do that. And what you find is that the connectome starts to change in between. Now, obviously, this little map that I've got is not exactly the same as if you were to wire your brain up to the ECG and see it. I know because I've done it. But what it's good at doing is allowing you to think in a different way from how you thought before and to get into a problem. The other thing that I use this for is that even though I'm deaf, I suffer from tinnitus. So I've got a continual hissing noise. But that's only there if I'm not focusing, if I'm not concentrating. And I can use this to change the way that I concentrate, because if you concentrate in the same mode all the time, you stop concentrating in it, so you need to be able to change at will. So even if you use this to get yourself set up to do stuff, you might be writing, you might still have the blank piece of paper in front of you. What you can use are some pithy phrases to get started. So here we've got um, some from the rational side of things, Alan Perlis. There's 120 of these, so somebody can Shout out a number between 1 and 120. 68. 68. If we believe in data structures, we must believe in independent and simultaneous processing. For I, why else would we collect items within a structure? Why do we tolerate languages that give us one without the other? You don't think of that every time you think about doing an MVC, do you? Uh, got another one for this one? 42. 42. You can measure a programmer's perspective by noting his attitude and the continuing vitality of Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see this is a bit old. And, uh, number three is one of my favorites. Syntactic sugar causes cancer of the semicolon. <laughs> for the, the right brain, we bring in another 120 maxims from Brian Nino. So this is what he uses when he's with the David Bowies, the Bonos of this world, you know? So you want to shout out a number between 1 and 120? 119. Sorry? 119. 119. Tape your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and the third one we have is what I was saying about critical thinking, a bit of satire, this guy called um, Russell Lakoff, he just takes the rip out of managers, basically. So these ones are very good. Uh, I wouldn't give them to your boss straight up, but you can think about them. So um, does anyone have a random number? 55. Excellent. The uniqueness of an organization lies more in what it hides than what it exposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that in certain places. Knowledge is of two types, explicit and implicit. Knowing this is implicit. And we'll come to implicit knowledge later. So this is just a very simple way of shifting things together and being able to change at will how you approach problem solving. The third way is divergent convergent thinking. So when I was coming back up from divergent convergent thinking means that instead of thinking in a linear process or drilling down into it, you open it up and you close it down using eight steps. 
The rainbow on your left goes through exploring, defining, generating, gathering, grouping, screening, prioritizing, and plan. And you want to do the, these uh, quickly. So the first thing that I did to check that my chops were still working in about September or October after the coma was this. Dun, dun, dun. And this is taken from uh, the Open University's MBA syllabus. First year you do general management, second year you do six month strategy and your brain goes pop. So they give you creative problem solving as a way past it. Uh, there's four authors, Jane Henry, Ros Bell, um, Eon Farmer and John Martin. Yes, not the musician. So each of the steps in the rainbow pattern relate to the colors of these diagrams here. So if you look at what um, the Spotify system does or any agile system, you get a card storyboard. By clicking on it, you get a set of instructions, which are really useful if you're wanting to do it. And uh, what the function is, the resource is whether you need a lot of people or a few people. And then what type of problem you're solving, the analytic mode, the intuitive mode, and the social mode. So you can use these to uh, set up workshops if you want to explore uh, and define ideas. I use them frequently, but then I wrote it, so I will. It actually took longer to get permission to use that stuff than it did to write the code to use it. Now, there is one method that I want to use because I think it's important, and that is the Disney method. So, Walt Disney was seen to have three different personality traits all existing inside himself at the same time. There was the dreamer, the realist, and the critic. And that carried on into the way that his teams wrote the storylines for the movies. They would have three different writing teams. Pixar use it today as well. You've got one that writes for the child, one for the teenager, and one for the adults. And that's why when they release the movies, they tie the strands together and you get a movie that works for the family to sit and enjoy. And we can take that approach back to our learning model and we can put in the curious, the creative, the critic, and the crowd. But you don't want to be the critic. What you want to do is become the cheerleader. Yeah, go and get a big set of pom-poms. <laughs> Pick yourself up. So what we do is we say, bin the inner critic. And this comes from uh, Mark Beatty, who wrote a, he, he set up a, a way of helping people write novels in a month. So every November, he sets something up, and he will offer to take your inner critic away from you. And the way he describes it is that the inner critic is the doubting, self-critical voice that we all inherited at puberty. An unfortunate door prize for surviving childhood is a busybody and perfectionist happy when it's dis disking our shortcomings and weaving past blunders into a rich tapestry of personal failure. So what you want to do is just put it in the bin. So that's really the three keys that I use to get ideas generated quickly. The way that I split my day up is that I plan each day. I've kept a diary for the last three years. And I've got three sections in my planning. I have one bit, which is my tasks that I have to do. I then have a dirt drive in case any of the tasks can't get done, I can do a contingency. And I've got another bit, which is called flow racking, which is the way that warehouses work. When something comes in, it sits in the flow rack, and it can go back out again. So if I get 10 minutes spare, I can do something with it. So those two things that I showed you with the brain with the tree in it and the Buddha with the little bolts, well, so those were 20-minute coding jobs, which were just something that I could do. So the next thing that we need to do is bring in estimation for this. So <clears throat> in music, you have a note, and a note has an envelope, and hence we have this thing. And then our work, instead of using work packs, which are the big things, or user stories, we can merge into work envelopes. And the way that we estimate the work is we move to the musical 
way of defining things. So if I play a note, yeah, fairly straightforward. Excuse me just a minute. If we change the default synth to a polysynth, do the same thing. So you can see the different shape of the sound. Did you hear it? Yes? No? It's not really so, so you can see that even though I'm doing nothing, the sound still goes on. So it's the way that the shape of the sound works. And with my disjointed view of the world, uh, I can take the shapes of basic instruments from uh, bass, drum, guitar, and then into the orchestrated ones of horns, keyboards, mallet strings, and woodwind. And these are pretty much close to the shapes that they are. And when we compare that back to our model, of SDDV, we can then map the circular model to a linear model that allows us to estimate. And when we estimate, I'm suggesting that we use a new model, which is uh, based on this. So this is a work, work envelope shaper. And as you can see, it has a basic default model. And we can select a different model and it moves for us. We can select a synthesizer, maybe a pad. Uh, continuous power and effort. And we can get hold of it and move it. And we can, modi we can modify the time on it. It's also got uh, a section where we can set up our tasks that we want to record against it. Now, um, ladies, I forgot to mention that I did have a period when I was in recovery called inappropriate behaviour window. And this is the sign of inappropriate behaviour window. I, W, I, w. Here comes inappropriate behaviour window. Um, so if you cannot listen to this, this is just for the boys. Right. So, um, you know when it is, you get your finger and you put it on a knob and you twist it. You kind of think different. You go to a different place, yeah? Let me, let, let me demonstrate, yeah? When I start twisting I know. Uh, Yeah, when I start um, twisting things around, you can see that I now have complete control over the estimating window. Uh, sorry about that. I'm just limited to um, a certain number of connections that I can get in here. Now, with that, if we were to take that into how we estimate Agile, uh, what we can do is we can put in a degree of time criticality. So if something must be in the sprint, it's all within the lead time. So you know that you're going to be constrained by how much scanning you do, how much design you do, and what effort you've got. So if you've got a 10-day sprint, and the figure 10 represents the number of days in the sprint, then you know that each day is 10% of that sprint. 
So you're going to split it out. So you're going to get lots of small tasks close together. Uh, in coming here and doing this, for me, it's this type of shape. I'm just speaking 100% for one hour. But to get it drawn up, it was that type of shape. So I was doing a little bit of work each day for about six weeks. You can't put that into a sprint. What you might say is devolve it or defer it. So you now get lead time and cycle time, which you can then move about again. But the interesting thing here is the effort scale. The effort goes up and down in a fixed time box. So if you were estimating in a Kanban way, instead of thinking linearly, you think of the setup time and you think of the way that you do it. And it means that you can take your estimation out of complexity into hours and days and give your boss a figure. And I think that's going to become more important uh, as we move towards Brexit and automation. And there is a, a serious point to that playing with the knob thing, which comes from Michael Polanyier, who was a knowledge management guru of the 1930s. He is considered to be the father of tacit knowledge. And basically that is, I know more than I can say, as you do. But how do you get it out? He used tools to be able to get it out. So when we estimate in an agile way, we estimate, and then in the sprint planning meeting, we stick up a number of fingers. I say we're doing it wrong. Do something with your fingers to make your brain think what it is that you've got to do. And if you get thrown out your sprint planning meeting, it's not my fault. <laughs> There's a new guy on the block who is the successor to Michael Pollyanni. Matthew Crawford is an American who did a PhD, very, very intelligent, joined the think tank, realized that all he was doing was creating arguments to pay for the sponsors of the think tank, so left the think tank and became a motorcycle mechanic. Motorcycle mechanic wasn't paying too well, so he started writing again. But he is getting a lot, a lot of good attention from business and from educationalists uh, about attention deficiencies. He's coming up with strategies to stop kids being put on Ritalin in America. So in terms of the idea summary, we say choose modes, choose life. Um, Use the cognitive studio to mix your brain to get it going the way that you want it to. And what we do in terms of training is we can come and teach you the technique library for that. That's based, as I said, on uh, a six-month part-time course, 30 hours a week. We can get it down to two days for you so that you can learn the 150 techniques that are in that creative library and get them applied into the strategy of your company. A lot of people do agile games, and I, I enjoy play, don't get me wrong, I do enjoy play, but I do want the play to be something that the company gets benefit from. Yeah? I went to one session that was, let's make flappy origami birds. Yeah, okay, we can do, but maybe a white elephant would be more relevant here. <laughs> I didn't like that. And when we're doing the estimation, we use the work envelope. Now, the work envelope is gonna be the basis for where we go next, which um, comes after the idea support. So when you want idea support, the thing to do, I find, is to set up A3 thinking. A3 thinking works inside sprints. It's a very short experiment that you can do. So again, you use the scan, design, deliver value. But you put it out in a way that is one side of A3 it used to be. But you can get it onto PowerPoint now. So what you would do is find out what's going on. Where's the problem? It might be something that you get from your climate measurement and we can help you with that. A lot of people use that as a starting point. The goals are usually smart. I prefer smart for this stuff than invest. Root cause analysis, we can help you out a lot there with uh, a bunch of models. So in the way that musicians these days use samples, we use um, a model sampler, and this can be set up to gear uh, strategy, you could take an operations thing looking at environment. So the strategist is looking outside, the operationalist is looking inside, and the team would be looking at their environment from Hertzberg, you know, motivation, hygiene. 
And what this means is that you could take this model, it's out on um, the Time and Emotion GitHub page, so you can take it down, you can fork it, you can make your changes and ask me to pull it back in. And if you make a change at a team level, and I accept it at an operations or strategic level, we've just done something that a normal company would take one year to do, which is incorporate emerging strategy coming into our way of working. Emerging strategy is one of Mintzberg's things. So what a strategist is usually doing is working through these kinds of models here. And uh, in here, you've got the stuff that you want to get done and the stuff that people then reinterpret and send back to you. So it's a way that how we work with Git, if I could train BAs to do it and if I could train managers to use it, we could get knowledge working so much faster. And again, I think that's something that's going to just make us step aside from automation. Uh, the value is you know, how you get things done in a place. Now, the important thing that I've found in asking people to change is that it takes six weeks for the neuroplasticity to change. If you're lucky enough to know a friend who's gone through uh, recovery from some form of addiction, and they've explained the process they go through, they will tell you that it's six weeks that you go along and you don't do anything but listen to what people say, and then you start moving. Same with Dr. Norman Doidge. He says, when you've got a brain injury, don't do anything for six weeks, and then you can start moving, just to let things settle down and get going. Same with this type of change. If you're trying to change inside a sprint, you don't try to change everything on one sprint. You lose two or three, depending whether you've got two or three week sprints, to give people enough time to accept the changes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the first time you set up a sprint, the, the waterfall manager comes along and says, is it working yet? <laughs> Jira face. <laughs> so the way that we do it is we use Suzuki Lean Learning to get going, uh, which means that we can use structured etudes to apply stuff and learn the theory later on for doing scales. And this comes into the changing agile principles. So the way that agile was first sold out, it was customer focus. The value is in the customer focus. Now what we're saying is that like good pizza, which will be here soon, I promise you, there's five value measures. And those are customer, self, team, managers, and the C-suite. And it's important that we put stuff in for ourselves because we need to get the skills that we're going to use going forward. So as we had the small, um, We've got a new uh, concept here. Called polyvalue. And it's the same way of estimating. You can use the basic synthesizer shapes. And you can put in different types of shape at the end. And you can move these around as well as an IUC fit. Um, and what you see here is that instead of the weighted shortest job first, if you're a Kanban affiliate, it's now the most valuable job first. So we take weighting off the different types of factor. Now this is a pretty good metaphor, and you can tell it's a good metaphor because we can change this to a rugby metaphor. So anyone like rugby? Oh, scrum, rugby, right? So anyway, what this shows is on the front team we've got um, some presets. So channel one fastball, and you want the ball coming through to the backs who are your managers to do the business. So attacking back line, you may want that. Uh, you might be setting something up for yourself. Blind side move. And th this again has corporate knowledge management models sitting underneath it. Uh, what we say here is that we take the A3 concept and expand it out to A pound. It's not A hash anymore. We're stealing it back from the Yanks, okay? It's a pound sign. Uh, and we look at operational ROI. So the bit in the middle is what most people use when they do value stream analysis, but they miss the learning to the left, and they miss the commercialization to the right. 
We don't do that because we use SDDV. Uh, we've got the strategic ROI. And what we're saying is that there's a couple of scary things in the forest out there. One is Brexit. We don't know what's happening. My view is that the banks are pulling in debt from restaurant chains and high street retailers. That's the same that has happened in Aberdeen just before the oil price went down. That ended up, I've got friends of friends who were found hanging in their orchards. They bought an orchard when they couldn't afford the orchard, uh, and it came to that. Automation is coming. We don't know when, where, or how, but I would be very surprised to find out that Amazon was not running something over the code that it's got within its AWS servers that will allow it to create some kind of AI gen that will come in. So we as humans, I think, should focus on the creative aspects that we have that machines won't emulate, but we can use machines and hand the drudge work off to it. And that's why I'm going down this creative problem-solving path. If you're into storytelling, as some people are, you can do the libretto, the book of the opera. So in this one, it was to try and get people to use Git run TFS. Uh, the other thing is, um, when you're trying to figure out what those values are, you follow the money. Uh, so you can ask a business analyst. Any business analysts? Hey, I used to be one. Product owners? No? Okay. So, well, you know how you get the Beaufort scale? And it just tells you about the hot air outside. Well, you can make the Beaufort and the Beaufort scale. This is the hot air of business change. And it, what I'm finding now in the Agile world is it's changing from BAs being embedded in the team, they kind of sit outside of it. Product owners are now, but well, you get them at different levels. You get a team product owner, maybe called the feature product owner, the product product owner, and the chief product owner. There'll be a chief product product owner, product owner quite soon, I'm quite sure. But uh, whilst this started off tongue in cheek, I find it's coming more and more useful now. So, ideal support summary we can teach you how to do this stuff, get it up and running very quickly, uh, and get it in a way which it complements the ideas that you get from the creative design. You use creative design before you do your rational design, and you find your rational design works faster. So this is a way of working fast. So in Music for Business, we're now going to start doing mapping. Does anybody want a drink or to stretch their legs? So a quick history of processes. Time and motion, as I alluded to before, was Henry Ford, F.W. Taylor. F.W. Taylor, great initials, WTF, F.W.T., same thing. Yay! Hey. Kanban came out of post-war Japan. We had PERT, the waterfall stuff. That came out after the war, where there was a lot of rebuilding to be done, and uh, construction, military used it, NASA used it. I first came into 1984, 85, with oil rigs. Then Agile came through, formalized in 2001 by some guys in the bar in Utah. There were women at the meeting, but they didn't invite them to it, which I think says a lot about the guys that set up Agile. The other thing I think that says a lot about the guys that set up Agile is there was not one strategic thinker amongst them. That's why it's not being taken up. They can't get the arguments right for people to do scaled Agile properly. At the moment, there's furniture rearranging. So I'm saying the next thing up is time and emotion. And by that, I mean the stuff we did at the beginning, when you went out and you found music that changed your mood. Most user journeys these days are based on a book called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. I think that's going to change to Don't Make Me Think, Make Me Feel. You have the first bit, and you'll join the second bit so that people will get a feeling as they go through. So. To step things up, we've got a bit of a speed now. Um, 4 to 12, we're going to change up to the wheel. And the 4 to 12 thing is like seasons to months, agile values to principles. So to map from our SDDV into the tertiary wheel, we take the four phases of SDDV, scan, value, design, deliver, take them up. And we have the steps. So when we scan, as we alluded to earlier, you would scan your environment, you'd scan other people, uh, yourself. When you do the design, I prefer to do it this way. So you've got the creative design, uh, the rational design, and the reflect and plan. And that means that the blue note is sitting between 
the creative design and the rational design. That's the sweet spot you're looking for when you design using this way. Um, when we deliver, we say that you get connection, resilience and autonomy. And again, the connect tone is, not the connect tone, which is the brain model, but the connect tone is the flat fifth, the note that was outlawed by the church because it makes people want to connect in ways that the church didn't want to connect. And for value, we have this. So you can join it up because the frequency in the wheel goes from low to high. You can make it the same as a chromatic scale. Like that. Uh, we're more used to our other ones. Um, we've now expanded it out. So we've taken the SDDV and we now have a 12 step process. And if you did the thing at the beginning, there was the colored bars that came up when you chose a mode. So those colors represent the colors that are on the outer circle here. The clock in the middle is an El Lizitsky clock. So it's the Red Army fighting the White Army in Russia. And it gives you the Daniel Kahneman thinking fast in the middle and thinking slow around the outside. So your minute hand would give you a fast snap decision, the intuitive gut feel. And if you think about things overnight, it'll come out. So now, here we go. Suzuki style, name that tune, yeah? Recognize it? Stick your hands up if you get it. Yeah. Okay, so that is Pretty Woman, as we know. And what we've done is we've taken the bit at the bottom, which is how the air is pumped, and mapped it across to the frequency. So we use Fourier transforms to get into the frequency. And that maps to our new scale, since we've got to... Well, I should switch my center back, but not to worry. And because we know how to get the notes mapped out, we can then start to say that we can get the value of the work that's done. So we now have a song that acts as a template for the structure of our work. A very simple one here to do an MVP. Does everyone follow that? No? Okay. So what we say is we've got a song, we hear the song. In the song, there's notes that go up. Yeah, the riff. And that's shown on the temporal scale, which we get. If, the, if you took uh, your phone and did Shazam on a song, it would go off and do this, and bring it back. So what we're saying is we can make a plan of the work that we do, and because each of the notes relates to one of the colors on this scale, scan the environment, do the design, use your resilience to get it done and put it out, you can do it that way. Beforehand, when I showed you the thing where you were um, twisting your knob, yeah, you remember, then it was a way that we could get the um, note shapes to come up. So each note that's inside the scales, what we've done is we moved from having notes to join them together into riffs. So what I find with a lot of scrum teams is they're just given tasks to do and they don't see the full value of what it is that they're doing. Make sense? I don't no. get the last step of how that equates to the envelopes that you, you're putting on them. Maybe it's just me. How this shape here equates to this. No. Where did that shape come from? The envelope. The envelope. Remember when I showed how to um, switch when I was doing this bit down here and shifting things on the screen? That's where the envelope came from, when you do your planning. Oh, I see. So you're estimating each of those yeah. notes. Yeah. So you can do it. So if you were going to learn the keyboard off the computer, it would set notes up and you'd play it like Guitar Hero. So you could use it as Guitar Hero, but we prefer not to. So we try another one. So again, same thing. They tripper, and this is like a user review, whereby 
you've got stuff going up. Here we're put, popping out into a higher octave, which is where the user sits. And again, you can put the notes up, and at the end of it, you get your value. Here's another one. Bit more difficult. Okay, yeah, so it's She Sells Sanctuary by the Cult. Now, this is a descending riff. So when you're in business and they speak about scale, they mean grow all the time, grow, grow, grow. Here, we use scales to grow and to come back. And it also lets us get in on one of Steve Jobs' misunderstood phrases. So what he said was, you can't figure out what happened until you join the dots backwards. What people didn't realize was that he was joining the dots backwards before he started. He would plan one way and plan back. When he and Wozniak went into the meeting in uh, California with their first computer, somebody said, oh, can we have one? Job's brain could see from making to operations to customer to profit and back again. That's what I think he was doing. So here, what we have is a way of coming down. In this case, there's no green stuff, so there's no, no work being done. It's more of an analysis thing that's being done. So you can do the analysis and you can go backwards in time. And you can change the way that this time flows. So this is one of the things I got from being in the hospital when I drew my clock and it didn't work properly. We can change time in our heads. And this is what differentiates this way of learning from the other learning, which is all clockwise. <laughs> okay. Well done. You with me now? Yeah. Okay, here comes the difficult bit. <laughs> no, now that you've got it, it's quite easy. So we're going to move from the 12 slice pizza to the boxes, stacked boxes. And this is a thing called pitch class. So on the keyboard, same note, just going up an octave. Each time you go up an octave, the pitch changes. So instead of showing it as a, a graph like that, we tend to think of it in music circles like that, a spiral. So we can think of business as being, instead of being a command and control structure, we can think of it as a keyboard, where you've got a strategy at the low end and the customer at the high end, uh, and the frequency doubles. So if we take this, So here's a business model where we've taken the octaves and stacked them one on top of the other. Strategy, operations, teams, customer. And what we do is we turn it into a helix. And with that helix we can change the shape. We can change the shape of it. So if you could imagine this with um, Git being involved in these, and these, shape, these things begin to link. We now have something that's equivalent to what Elon Musk does with his firms. So, oh yeah. And the way that we categorize this is that we look at you at the center of your work, yeah? You are the most important thing in your life. If you're not working, you can't support the other people that depend on you. So it's you, your team are close around you. Your operations are a bit further out, becoming less and less personal. Your strategy is further out, and your customer is further out too. So if we look at the delivery by layer, then I've been talking about connection, resilience, and autonomy. And those are the personal attributes that we get from sitting above commitment, delivery, and deployment, the agile things that we are meant to do. And that sits above targets, facilitation, and reporting that the middle managers do aims and goals, control and results, which the um, C-suite, the strategists and the investors will be doing all the time. So if we can link that together, we have a much more sensible way of scaling. The other thing that we've done here is we've put an inversion on the business. So the leaders are people that can invert in how they operate. Uh, an administrator is always top down. Do you want to see how a scroll of scrums becomes a bureaucracy? Do 
just put that down. I'm aware that we're getting short in time, so I'll be fast. So here's a scrum of here's a scrum of scrums. And if you iterate it, it grows up to be recommend a control structure. Fantastic. Uh, if you use the time in the motion website down in the features where it's got the um, the Escher thing here, which is how I see your business. I told you that we were satirical. I'm not really with this. I'm being quite serious. Uh, at the top in the red area is the strategy with the monks going round and round and round. In the orange is the operations, the teams and the customers down here, and you can see people moving around. So to speed up through what we've got to get through, Discord and Harmony. It comes down to Weinberg, and here's three rules of consulting. So if you work for yourself, you probably know them. One, no matter what people tell you, there's a problem. Two, the problem is always people. Three, charge by the hour. Right? So this comes up, and if I tell you about Henry Wood, the guy that invented the prompts, he was a conductor. He used to have terrible trouble with his timpani players and these triangle players, because they didn't do much during it, so they'd go down the pub. They'd be conducting away. They're not there. So he had to lock the door, and then they'd let them in. And then he had uh, this other problem where the section leaders for the horns or the trumpets or the wind uh, strings wouldn't turn up. They'd send somebody in there instead. Sound familiar to anything? Uh, and that's pretty much like Oasis. You know, so you've got Noel sitting in the studio doing things, Liam gets bored because then the pub comes back at closing time with all the drunks, you know. And uh, the Oasis guys, they, they should really be called um, Dev and Obs, not Dev Ops, Dev Ops for obnoxious, <laughs> which I think would fit. Whereas Dev Ops seems to be the place where there's disharmony or discord in business for our stuff. You know, in some cases, trying to get stuff out the door, it's a bit more like a derby match, and people taking chunks out of each other. Whereas if you do it in business, the real thing I think is happening is that with... Um, when you've got two notes and a keyboard that, don't, that are close together, they don't play well, And that's the same with DevOps. So the things that you can do to get around it is to use one as a passing note. So DevOps should not be in existence. If we'd got the one push deployment, would have been away, we wouldn't have needed it. Um, the other thing is the speed of the run. You can go up or you can pedal uh, where you got through it. I've been in one situation where we had a, a company that built an insurance sales system and DevOps was bad in there. They forgot to put an audit trail on it, so we had quite a lot of faults to fix. Uh, and the way that that was done was a nine-step move up the octave to get things out. There's other process points, and what I'd like you to do now, if you could, is there's um, cards on the seats around you. If on one side you could write down the three process pain points that you have, and on the other side, write three songs that you like. I'll take them away and try to make out mappings like the um, She Sells Sanctuary and Pretty Woman. So I'm making a collection of those, but rather than me taking them out where people are just laughing at oh, this dad rock again, <laughs> I'd like other people's views. So if you could do that and pop them on the table at the end, that would be really good. So the things that I see are when we try to apply production line metrics to creative cognition, it doesn't work. Um, orchestras and blues, so we're doing that, good. So, finally, two process comparison, and I'll show you how I like to get the benefits of both. I don't know if you'll love this. So here's a, a classical waterfall, <coughs> and it is literally waterfall. And you can see here that there's annotations on it. 
I think the Italians have about 40 to 50 different ways of telling you what speed to play at. Whereas you try that in an agile thing, that speed, that's your cadence, that's your velocity. Absolute rubbish. Um, you've got different voices in it, it looks water folly, and more annotation. People are encouraged to annotate in classical music. Uh, agile is like this in my view. Okay, and it's just a chorus, yeah? There's no verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, out. And people get bored doing this. It's not been recognized yet. The reason it's also like the blues is that the whole thing's call and response. The customer calls, the team responds. The test calls, the code responds. The way it's set up is the way I like to run things where the um, yellow is what the team do. And I try to get the team to be able to see further ahead in the sprint, so they get more time to do the design of the envelopes, the twisty knob thing. <coughs> and this bit here where it comes out is um, where you get the cadence. So you would have uh, on that red five, your user review, the blue four with the team make the changes to it, then it goes on and bang, you've got your retrospective right at the end, and then you start into the next course. Spotify tried the squad system, and that was just cobbling three things together, it's like status quo, without the change of guitars. The quo changed guitars so it didn't bore people, so it could change keys, you know, it's like that. So, uh, we've got variations on the theme for Agile. Scrum, pure blues, Robert Johnson. Scrum band, blues, with a bit of improvisation, Miles Davis. And Kanban, <coughs> Ornette Coleman, yep, <laughs> no blues. <laughs> No scale, no structure, but a fantastic musician. So, what would be nice to have in an amalgamated world would be a richness of classical and annotation, speed of agile and improvisation, harmonious workers practicing your house. So, it's thus spake Zakathustra. Um, who'd have thought this, huh? <laughs> Lou Reed, David Bowie, Iggy Pop, and Iggy Pop's the only one alive. The other two broke into the asylum that he was in to deliver drugs to him. So anyway, you can conduct to this if you like. This is, this is the last bit. We won't do the encore. Uh, signals in the noise. You can try and conduct this. And what this is, this is really where this thing, how I hear music, how I hear business as music comes from. So what we have is, this is the equivalent of having Radio 3 at the strategy level, Radio 2 for the managers, and uh, Radio 1 for the teams. The squares that we have here are fast Fourier transforms that are mapping the frequency of the songs that you're about to hear. So if you want to get your batons ready, and conduct along if you can. As always, I always forget that this stop, this stop, this stop, this stop, and then this, this stop, this stop, and then this, this stop, this stop, this stop. It doesn't work. It's difficult to conduct this. This stop, this stop, this stop. Right? So what you've got in your business, you think you're doing it all joined up. You're not. There's three separate things that are going on. It'd be better to do this. This will take you. This will take you back in time. How you taught to play together? It's a little bit dissonant because I think that I'm really Terry Riley or Steve Reich doing minimalist stuff. But you can see that that works for a company that might be a small startup. One strategy, one product, one team, get it out the door. That kind of thing works. When you've got lots of different companies going on, it doesn't work. 
So when we all do it properly like this, we get this type of thing. Now, what you'll notice is that we've got our dream system here. We've got strategy at the bottom. We have strategy supporting the people above. We can see with the yellow bars in here, we've got pitch class going in. We can see that we have different content using the colors to get the out, but we don't get the value to the end. We've got a section here where the teams, while they're not playing, are involved in the rehearsals so that they can practice to see what's going on. So when it's time to play, everybody's practiced and rehearsed. Too much in Agile, we just go straight to perform or record. So this one you can conduct. Or you could be the ape with the bone. Is that coming out to you? And you can see that it's not until the music finishes that you get the accrued value from it. So as it's going through, the little uh, value counters were counting up all the value, but it wasn't really giving anything to the company until it was through. So that, I think, is pretty much what we can do. So for the coder, um, the key points that I want to make are that we're all creative and we should use it. And we can use the tools to get going with it if we want to. Um, we estimate using envelopes for speed and success. And we can arrange the envelopes into phrases and parts, as we've seen, and we can aggregate it. And we can use the signals and the noise. So the offer that I'm going to make to you at the end of this first gig that I've done is um, time and emotion to consultancy and training. So hands up those that would like climate measurement for their teams. Do you think that would be worthwhile? Cool. One. Uh, the design thinking, is that worthwhile to people? Was that of interest at all? A3, A star for polyvalue. Okay. Two. And polyvalue driven design for the next Paradigm? Hey. Oh. Hey. Two. So, oh, we just done that. So, thank you, and good night. <laughs>